Welcome back to the Aubergine Chef. Now today we're going to be making um, a sheet cake. It's going to be made with the vanilla chiffon genoise and the vanilla Italian buttercream, but it's going to be decorated for a friend of a friend basically. The doggy daycare where I take my dog Pumpkin, um, one of their friends um, won an award for dog agility and I'm not exactly 100% sure exactly what it is, but apparently it's a huge deal. It's probably one of those, like probably the top highest um, honor that their dog can receive for dog agility. So um, they are um, ordering a cake um, from me, so I decided to make the vanilla chiffon juana vanilla Italian buttercream since I made it pretty far back um, last summer so we can recap and see what it's like to use a recipe in a different size setting. Now uh, cost effective wise this recipe isn't one of those recipes that you really want to be using in your bake shop because um, it's so heavily dependent on eggs. Unless you can get your eggs in in a carton or frozen or however. If you're using fresh eggs, it's really expensive really fast. Um, especially if you're using the organic kind, cage-free, this and the other. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to try and look up a couple cakes um, in my cookbooks, and my school books for um, a Blitz vanilla cake. I know we had one called a vanilla um, liquid shortening sponge cake, but liquid shortening spo liquid shortening isn't normally available to the masses, so I'm going to have to try and think of a different blitz cake that we can do. All that aside, I am looking forward to making this cake because I have a lot of great ideas for the decorations on top. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So um, first we're going to bake the cake, and then we're going to make the icing, and then we're going to decorate it. So if you want to see if you want to skip right to the decorating, you want to go, go ahead and skip to the last third of the video or so. Um, but we're going to go ahead and weigh out. Our, I've already weighed out our ingredients for the vanilla butter, or for the vanilla chiffon genoise cake. And what we have here is we have 18 uh, egg whites, uh, or one pound two ounces. Each egg white is one ounce, and equal parts of egg yolks, so one and one. Uh, so 19 egg yolks altogether. And now I have one egg that I haven't separated, so. Did I say 19? I meant 18. 18 egg whites and 18 egg yolks. And I have one egg that I have to add, so technically these are only 17, but I wanted to show you how to separate an egg because I want to go over that every episode because it's a pretty quick thing to do and some people never don't see my other episodes. Um, I also have 14 ounces of granulated sugar in each of these bowls, so that's 28 ounces all together, and half of it's going to be used to make a meringue out of the egg whites, half it's going to be made, you know, used to make a meringue or a uh, ribbon stage egg yolks. So we're going to use half and half. I also have seven ounces of vegetable oil which is going to go into the egg yolks. Then I also have, let's see, one pound four and two-thirds ounces of all-purpose flour which we're going to fold in the end with three ounces of room temperature water and one ounce of vanilla extract. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, you're going to want to go ahead and have, if you're going to do this recipe, um, you want to have some pretty big bowls standing by for when you're folding. Um, the standard recipe makes two 9 inch round cakes, but this one makes four 9 inch round cakes. And the way that you can figure out um, how many 9 inch round cakes or how much of the single recipe you need to make to make a larger cake, the half sheet cake, which we're making in this case, what you do is you take your 9 inch cake pan and you fill it up with water as high as you would fill it up with cake batter. Now normally I say weigh everything out, but when it comes to filling out cakes, most bakers, if not all bakers, will fill based on volume because what we're doing, especially with all these meringues and whipping the egg yolks, is we're creating air. And the amount of air cells that get um, in incorporated in your batter each time could be different or you could lose more air cells as you're folding. So while weight is consistent, you're going to, you might have some batter left over. You might even have enough batter to make another 9 inch round cake depending on how much volume you were able to add. So it's always better to go with volume. Plus you always want to try and go about 2 thirds, 3 quarters of the way up of a pan anyway. And depending on what the batter is, it may weigh differently. So going by volume is a little bit more reliable when it comes to filling batter. Now that's probably the only time I'm ever, ever going to go based on volume. But anyway, so what you do is you fill up your 9 inch cake pan with water, about 2 thirds, 3 quarters of the way up, and you pour it into the half sheet pan or whatever pan, cake pan, you're trying to figure out how many of the 9 inch cake pans goes into the larger cake pan. And you keep doing this until you get 2 thirds or 3 quarters of the way up in the corresponding larger pan. 
And so it took four times the nine inch cake pans to fill up the half sheet cake pan. At least that's what I found. So I just doubled the uh, regular recipe, the two, the two nine inch cake pan, or two nine inch cake rounds uh, to make four nine inch cakes. So we're gonna need some pretty big bowls for folding later on, but hopefully we won't have any issues in the mixer, especially with the egg whites. So why don't we go ahead and start by separating the egg and then we'll get straight onto the mixer. And one thing you wanna to remember too is you wanna to wipe out your, uh, your mi electric mixer bowl and your whip attachment for your electric mixer with a little bit of vinegar. That's gonna help clean out any fat that you can't see on the bowl because any fat is gonna inhibit the egg whites from whipping up to their full volume or, or at all. So make sure you always, 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 always wipe out your bowls with a little bit of vinegar. So to separate an egg, crack open your egg and let the egg white drop through. Then pass the egg yolk back and forth in the eggshell until more of the egg white drops through or until you're pretty much satisfied with how much egg, egg, yolk, egg white has separated. Put your egg yolk to the side and your egg white is separated. Now when you're doing as many eggs as I am, it's always a good idea to put your egg white in a separate bowl before adding it to your larger um, your larger batch of egg whites. And that's just because if something happens, if your egg yolk breaks, if it's a bloody egg, you really don't want that dripping down into, I don't know, 17 egg whites. And then you have to start all over again, or it's just, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of wasted money. So save yourself the trouble and just use one extra bowl. Okay, so because we have so many egg whites, I kind of half expect this to almost overflow with egg whites. So we're gonna do our best and hope that it doesn't go get to that case. So remember to make a meringue. You want to whip it and start whip and start whipping it until it gets frothy. And when it starts getting frothy, is when you're going to slowly add in your granulated sugar. Okay. Now that our egg whites are frothy, let's go ahead and slowly add in our sugar. Okay, so we're at medium to stiff peak, so we're okay to come off the mixer. Okay, so once you've separated your egg whites, take them out of the bowl anyway, your egg white meringue, take it out of the bowl, put it in a separate bowl, and then bring your egg, egg yolks into this bowl, and um, don't have to worry about cleaning it out or anything like that, because unlike egg whites, egg yolks will whip up um, because, well, you don't have to worry about fat or anything like that, because, well, egg yolks are almost all fat. But the easy thing is you can just add all the sugar in at once, but you don't want to let it just sit there. You want to go ahead and start mixing it right away because the egg yolks can chemically cook with sugar just sitting on top of it. So go ahead and whip up these egg yolks until they reach about ribbon stage, and I'll show you what that, what that looks like. Okay, so what's meant by ribbon stage is that the egg yolks can pile on to each other, or on top of itself actually, and kind of form these ribbons. And the ribbons will hold their shape for about seven to 10 seconds before they are absorbed right back into the pool of whipped egg yolks. So we could whip it a little bit longer if we wanted to, but we're at a pretty good state right now. So, and don't worry about over whipping egg yolks. Unlike um, meringues, where if you over whip it, they can kind of lose their sheen and they can kind of lose their volume. Egg yolks, you can just whip and whip and whip and whip forever. So um, if you're not sure if you're at the right state, just go ahead and whip it up and any, whip it up some more anyway. But we're good, so we're gonna take this off. Well, actually, no. We need to add in the oil. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the oil, and egg yolks are a natural emulsifier, which allows moisture and oil to exist in the same product because the emulsifier kind of holds onto the oil. So what we need to do is we need to emulsify this oil using the egg yolks. And what we're going to do is we're going to allow it to do its job, but we have to do it slowly. So we're going to drizzle it in a little bit at a time while it's running at medium speed. If we go too fast, the egg yolks will break and we'll, we might not be able to save them. So we've got to take our time when we do this.
Okay, so once all of our oil has been incorporated, we're good to come off the mixer, for real this time. Okay, so I've got my biggest bowl here, and looking at it, it might not be big enough, but we're going to cross our fingers and hope. So, um, but, so the first thing we need to do is we need to add our egg yolks. Okay, and then to these egg yolks, we're going to kind of do what they do with madelines, and we're going to fold in the flour, and we're also going to fold in the liquid ingredients. We're going to do it alternatively. So we're going to do it like one, um, one addition of water, then one addition of flour, one addition of water, one addition of flour. We're going to do it just like that. So we're going to start with the flour. So I add in about half the amount of flour. If you have a friend with you that can help you and has a free hand, you can go ahead and continuously fold in flour while they drizzle it in. Um, you don't really want to do this on the mixer because you might lose more volume than if you were doing it by hand. Remember that your goal is to preserve as much volume as possible. Okay, so add some of the liquid. Okay, so once we have the flour and the liquid ingredients mostly incorporated into our egg yolks, you can see that I've lost um, a great deal of volume, so keep that in mind. And then now we're going to go ahead and fold in our egg whites. And we're going to do that in three steps, so that way we don't lose all the volume, because the egg whites volume is a little bit more delicate than the egg yolks volume. And the more steps we do it, the less air cells will break. But at the same time, if you do a crazy amount of steps, then you might end up breaking a lot of them and wasting your time. So you want to just do it in two or three steps. So your first step, you're basically just lightening up the egg yolks so that way they can hold on to the egg whites a little bit better because the first step you're going to lose the most amount of volume. Okay, we're going to continue to lighten it, but now we're going to go ahead and try our best not to break more of the egg white cells this time around, air cells. Okay, and before the egg whites we just added are completely incorporated, we're going to add our last addition of egg whites, which should have this bowl filled to the very top. Okay, so we're ready to pour it into our prepared cake pan. So this is my half sheet cake pan. Sorry, it's so big, it's hard to see in the camera. And so I've already prepared it by spraying it with uh, pan-release grease. Uh, make sure you get the corners really well, and then put a piece of parchment paper right in the middle that's going to help release the cake uh, when it comes out, and then spray the parchment paper as well. So let's go ahead and pour our cake batter right into the cake pan.
Okay, and it looks like despite all the air cells that I may have lost during the folding process, that there is almost more cake batter than we need. So that's good news that we were able to save most of the volume. So maybe next time I may only have to use uh, do a three batch or a three three nine inch cake cake round or three nine inch cakes batch. So we're gonna go ahead and bake this. Um, we're gonna bake it at three hundred degrees for about an hour or until it tests done. So it may take an hour and a half. But unlike the rounds, you want to make sure you bake these at a lower temperature than your rounds, so that way the middle doesn't rise um, significantly higher than the other side, and you have a very uneven cake. Okay, so our cake um, is completely cooled off to room temperature. Um, when I was letting it cool off in the, bake, in the cake pan, I took it out of the oven and let it cool off on the cooling rack for like 10 minutes. And then I removed it by using the brownie, the, uh, I call it the brownie method, I don't know. I Probably it's just a regular method of releasing cake and brownies, but what you do is you go around the edge with a knife to loosen it. And normally if the cake is baked right, it should pull away from the sides of the pan um, within the 10 minutes that it's cooling down. Um, but sometimes it'll get stuck on the corners, especially if it's a square cake, obviously. So if you want, to, if you need, you need to go with the uh, knife, especially in the corners. Then what you do is you just flip the whole cake over, just like this, and it should pop out. But I went ahead and I trimmed down my sides a little bit too, because it was a little bit uneven using a large um, serrated knife. But um, I'm just about ready to make my icing. I have all my ingredients weighed out. But what I want to do first is I want to cut my layers so that way I, I, I can go straight into icing as soon as I finish um, making it. Hopefully, as long as it's cool off. So, first thing we want to do is we want to bring this over to our turntable. Okay, so when you're cutting cake layers, um, you can use floss, the dental floss trick um, some people like to use. It's a lot of people recommend it on my blog when they comment. You just take a piece of floss, put it where you want. If you need to, make a little indent or a little engraving with the knife. Uh, fill that engraving with the floss and then just pull your floss tight and it should cut. Um, I actually prefer to use the knife method. It's just what I've always used you know, the entire time I've been baking. So I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. And I can show you how to use it with a knife. So what you do is you just find a spot in the cake in the middle and kind of go around keeping your knife level and just dig in a little bit. Okay, so once you've made your mark all the way across the cake, then you can go ahead and start using a gentle sawing motion to go in. And sometimes, depending on the thickness of your cake, it depends on how you hold your knife, how you want to cut. So if you hold your knife completely flat and the cake is really stiff, you might force your cake, you might force your knife to go up or force it to go down. Normally it'll force it to go up. So what you want to do is you want to counter that by slightly angling your knife downwards so that way when the cake is forcing your knife to go up, you're actually forcing it to go down and it ends up being straight. Okay, so once you've cut through most of your cake, you can normally go ahead and cut straight across and get that last piece that you may have missed.
and it should come right off. And we have a nice, even, flat layer. Okay, so before we start making the icing, the other thing you want to do too is you want to go ahead and use a little simple syrup to make your cake a little bit more moist. If it needs it, usually it does. Uh, couldn't hurt to add a little bit more moisture. And all simple syrup is is equal parts of sugar and water. So one pound sugar, one part water, or one pound water, with a little bit of cream of tartar, which helps it prevent it from crystallizing. And you just bring it to a boil on the stove. You don't have to boil it for a long time. You don't have to reduce it. Just bring it right to a boil. And what this does for your cake is it adds moisture back into your cake, but it also adds a little bit of sweetness. And if you flavored your simple syrup, like if you um, infused any herbs while you were boiling the um, water, then you add a little bit of flavor too. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little bit of simple syrup on both of my layers. And then we'll go ahead and get started on making our icing. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over um, the ingredients for our vanilla Italian buttercream. So here in this pot, I have one, let's see, 12 ounces of granulated sugar and four and a half ounces of hot water, or just water, and just a tiny bit of cream of tartar to help prevent crystallization. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring this to the, up to a boil with the lid on. And that's, what that's gonna do is it's gonna wash down the sides. It's a little trick that I use sometimes. Um, it's gonna wash down the sides of the pot in case we had any granulated sugar on the sides. And you wanna make sure too that your sugar, you pushed it around a little bit with your hand so that way all the sugar is wet. Because if there's a dry part of the sugar in the bottom, it's gonna caramelize and burn while the rest of the sugar is boiling and then you're just gonna end up with burnt sugar all the way around. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna boil this and then after it's boiled for a little bit, we're gonna take the lid off. Then we're gonna put our thermometer probe in and we're gonna take its temperature until it reaches 230 degrees. At 230 degrees, we will have, we will start making um, our egg white meringue on the mixer. And then, once the sugar reaches 250 degrees, um, it'll be ready to use. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour the 250 degree Fahrenheit um, sugar into our egg white meringue. Now for our egg white meringue, let's go over to our mixer. Remember for our, uh, whenever we're making a meringue, you always wanna wipe out your bowl and your whip with a little bit of vinegar like we did earlier. And we have nine egg whites in the mixing bowl. And we also have six ounces of granulated sugar setting aside, um, ready to be used to make, start the, uh, making the meringue. And I also have, let's see, one pound, two ounces of um, unsalted room temperature butter, and it's cut into pieces. As you can see, it's right here on top of the coffee maker. And it's ready to go in, but we won't need it until much later in the process. The first part is all about timing, getting that sugar hot while we, get, while we have the meringue ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and start boiling the sugar, and then uh, when, when it reaches 230 degrees, we're gonna go ahead and start whipping up our egg whites. Okay, so our sugar has reached 230 degrees, so we're gonna go ahead and start making our egg white meringue. Same process for, as for the cake. Once the egg whites are getting frothy, we're gonna go ahead and slowly add in our sugar. All right, so let's go ahead and start adding in our sugar. Remember, this is six ounces of granulated sugar and nine egg whites. Okay, so once our sugar has reached 250 degrees, at medium speed, we're gonna go ahead and slowly drizzle it in. Be careful not to hit the side of the bowl or the whip, otherwise you'll get sugar chunks. Okay, now we're gonna continue to whip our egg whites until they're completely cool. At this time, you can add a little bit of vanilla extract for flavoring. And this process could take a little while. Just make sure you fill it with the bottom, with the uh, heel of your wrist. And when it feels cool to touch, then we can add the butter. Now it's easier to make icing like this, buttercream icing, when the area you're in, the, when the room you're in is cool. So it might be best to turn off your heat or turn off your air conditioning or turn down your air conditioning, whichever. And 
make the room a little bit colder, somewhere in the 60s. Otherwise, you can, you can use your refrigerator to cool down your icing and come back to it, especially after you've added the butter. Okay, so at this point, your, I, uh, your Italian meringue should be cooled, and it should also be very, fairly thick. It should be very um, firm, very foamy almost, um, but it should be very thick. Um, you should be able to pick it up with a spoon, turn the spoon upside down, and it shouldn't fall off. That's how thick it should be. So at this point, we're ready to add our butter. So we're going to add our butter all at once, and what's going to happen is when, when, it starts, when the mixture starts going, it's going to look like the meringue has broken and the butter has destroyed the meringue. It's going to look soupy. It's going to have a very separated look, but that's okay. It's just working. Just keep letting it whip over and over and over again until it comes together again. Now, if you um, are having issues and it's not coming back together again, even, if you, even after you've whipped it for a long time, there's uh, a couple reasons for that. Um, either your meringue was still too warm or it's too warm in your kitchen. And so the only way to bring it back is to cool down the meringue or cool down the room. And by doing that, you can stick it into the refrigerator, let it cool off, and then bring it back and try whipping it up again. That's usually the main cause, the main reason the Italian buttercream doesn't come back together. We're going to lose a little bit of volume, so it's probably going to be about... This bowl is really full right now, but we're going to lose a little bit of volume, so you don't have to worry about overflowing. So let's go ahead and mix it in. Okay, so I've refrigerated my icing for about 20 minutes or so, and now it's good and stiff. So sometimes, even right after you make it, no matter how cool everything is, if the icing is still soupy, like if you shake the bowl and the icing moves like soup, it's too cold, even if it's all together and it's all nice and firm. You want it to be a little bit cooler than that, so that way it holds its volume, and so it's not sliding off the cake while you're icing it. So I'm going to try and whipping up a little bit more volume into the icing. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is on our middle layer, we want to have a raspberry filling. So keep in mind that if you're doing this cake, you may not have enough icing to do um, the entire sheet cake if you're going to fill the middle with icing. You'll have enough if you don't cut the cake. You don't have to cut the cake in the middle if you don't want to. Um, that's all optional. And, and if you're going to fill it, obviously you're going to need to. But um, for sheet cakes, you don't really need to um, cut them in half. So if you don't cut it in half, you should have enough icing to coat the um, sides and the top. And if you are going to fill the middle with icing, then you're going to need to make it a little bit bigger. And I'll have a larger batch on the recipe on the website. Okay, so this is the same raspberry filling that I've been using. It's the one that we used for the Linzer tarts, and it's the one we used for the one, two, three dough cookie sandwiches. It's the um, filling we don't have to refrigerate, so we don't have to worry about refrigerating this cake now. Um, Buttercream uh, holds up well at room temperature. It does not need to be refrigerated. So take your time to do the filling. Okay, and before I get started um, icing and putting the second layer on top, I'm going to put a damp paper cloth underneath this cake, which is what you normally want to do, so that way it keeps your cake from sliding around while you're icing it. Um, I just forgot this time, but good thing I remembered. And the reason we put the ring of icing on the outside of the filling is when we squish down with the top layer, if the filling for some reason squishes out, what's going to come out is icing. It's not raspberry filling, it's not going to come out. So that way it won't ruin our top at all and we won't have to worry about that. Okay, let's put our top layer on. Make sure we're good and centered. Okay, we'll go ahead and squish down. 
Okay, and our cake is in place. Okay, so when you're icing a cake, no matter what shape or size it is, start at the top. And then using a, a spatula, using an offset spatula, go ahead and smooth it out. Okay, and then once you get your top covered, you want to make sure you push it all the way to the edge. Your icing on top doesn't have to be completely smooth just yet. Um, you're going to go back and finish the top again anyway, so we don't have to be too perfect on the top. Okay, I found uh, to reach over the cake, you just do it over the corner on the side. It's a little bit easier to ice your cake when you're reaching over because you can control how much icing is going on the side. And it's just a better angle, plus you can see better. Okay, once you have your sides and your corners covered completely with icing, you can either use a bench scraper, but I find that with rectangular cakes, it's a little bit easier to just use your offset spatula and just kind of go against the cake and smooth out the side. If your cake cardboard is about the same size as your cake, you can use that as a guide. Um, if it's not, then you're going to have to uh, use a little bit of guesswork. Make sure to scrape your spatula in between icing your sides or smoothing your sides down so you don't leave a path.
Okay, once your, uh, your sides are smoothed down to where you like it, uh, we can go ahead and finish the top. So if a ring has formed on the top around your cake to get rid of it, you just smooth towards the center, scraping in between each smooth. Right now I'm using my mixing bowl, my electric mixing bowl, as a uh, you would you, which you would scrape it with, so I'll show you. I'm just scraping it like that in between each smoothing, so that way I don't have any icing on my spatula leaving a track behind. And of course I knock my bowl over. Anyway. I'm not super great at the sides, but I'm, I think I'm pretty decent at getting the top pretty smooth. I'm a lot better with round cakes than square cakes. I'll go ahead and say that. I have a lot more experience with uh, round cakes. But, you know, I'm never going to get experience doing square cakes and rectangle cakes if I don't do them. So, here I am. You just got to have an all or nothing attitude when it comes to pastry. Just go in and do it. And if it comes out great, great. If it didn't, learn from your mistakes. And the next time it'll be even better. Okay, I'm getting kind of close to the top of my cake, so I don't want to smooth it out too much more. We can cover up some of these air bubbles with some decoration anyway. Go ahead and put a little bit more here. In here. Now if you were doing a fondant cake, you would want to get your sides as smooth as possible. All these little air bubbles would be completely unacceptable because they would show up in your fondant. Your fondant can cover some mistakes, but don't count on it. Um, the fewer mistakes that your surface has, uh, the happier you'll be when it does cover up those mistakes, but also the less uh, ripple effect that you'll see in your cake. On your fondant anyway. Okay, so I've transferred my cake to the board that I'm going to be serving it on, so that way I can decorate. Um, I always pipe my borders onto something that they're going to serve, serve it with, so that way they can still see the border. I'm trying to get as much of this cake, much of this cake in as I can. It's kind of a big cake. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to pipe a shell border. So the person I'm making this for wants a lime green cake with a purple shell border and then we're going to do some dog agility decorations. So this should be pretty interesting. I haven't really done the kind of decorations I'm doing now. Um, I've seen other cakes with it so I'm pretty sure we'll be pretty successful. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm going to use an 824 star tip to pipe a shell border. Remember that you're going to go down and then forward and then back, up and back. So you're going to create kind of like a sideways J. Just kind of like that. Okay, and we're going to do a, star, a shell border along the bottom as well.
Okay, so I'm going to use a Wilton 3 tip to pipe on the uh, words that they want on this cake. It's the owner's name and then the dog, as well as the dog's uh, new title with his new record. So let's see. So, Kayla and Mock Freeze. Okay, so I let my cake sit in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes just to firm up um, so I can actually stick the decorations into the cake. And what we're doing is we're doing um, basically candy decorations. We're not doing a whole lot of fondant for this cake. So, one of the first decorations I'm going to put on is the seesaw, which the dogs use. And what I'm using is a Toblerone for the axis. And to make the cake look a little bit more together, I'm using a piping bag fitted with a grass tip, a small grass tip, to kind of give it um, a more uniform look. So that way, and the uh, icing in the piping bag is a slightly darker shade. I darkened it with a little bit of moss green, not a whole lot. And so here I have a cookies and cream candy bar covered with a fruit roll up. And so we're thinking that the dog is going in this direction, so he's already gone past the seesaw. Okay, and then we also have uh, a tube. And this tube was made with lifesavers and a fruit roll up. And the lifesavers stick to the fruit roll up pretty well, so when you roll it up, it's pretty easy to do. Okay, next is one of our more complicated decorations. It's the tire. So for the tire, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it into the cake as best as I can. Then, to look like it has supports, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in some Kit Kat bars. And then, kind of like a glue, we're going to use some brown icing, which is basically just uh, the icing we had, and it's cover or uh, mixed with cocoa powder and brown icing. And then we're going to pipe a little rope. Okay, so that's the tire. And then we have the A bar, which is basically just a couple of planks of wood standing up. I'm using a Hershey's chocolate bar. Okay. And you may not be able to see it, but in the chocolate, I used a toothpick and kind of drew in. Um, wood marks, so that makes it look more like wood as opposed to chocolate bar. 
pipe some grass. And then we'll pipe some of the brown icing here to kind of seal it. And then we're also going to pipe some lines. This is where the dog would climb up. And then lastly, we're going to do uh, what's called weave poles. And the weave poles are basically just, it's just like a long plank of plastic with planks coming out. And what they'll do is they weave in and out of the poles. And so we'll just do a short one right here. Ours is going to be made out of wood. And what I'm going to use is something called Pocky. Now, if you're not familiar with Pocky, Pocky is a, I don't know if it's Japanese, huh? it says product of Japan, so I guess it is Japanese. It's a Japanese uh, biscuit sticks that are dipped in chocolate. Now, I wanted to get the yogurt covered ones, but I couldn't find them, and the yogurt ones would have had a white covering, so that way I could use the fruit roll-ups as a kind of decoration to kind of give it like a stripe, let's say if I had a white Pocky, and then I could do a little red stripe around the top using some of the fruit roll-up, but we'll have to make do with what we have. So, it comes in a little pouch, you just open the pouch up, and you have these little sticks. And these sticks are great for the weave pole, so we'll just push it right into the cake. And Pocky is really, really delicious, so you don't have to worry about your clients not liking it, because it's basically a cookie dipped in chocolate, it's just in stick form, so I guess it's a, an interesting effect for our use. Okay, and that's pretty much it for the decorations. We're pretty much done. Um, I'm going to do one more thing I think I might like to do. is I'm going to try and do doggy footprints along the cake. So what I need to do is I need to refrigerate it for probably about an hour so the icing is good and hard, and then I can use a chopstick and make imprints into the cake. So we're going to go ahead and refrigerate it for an hour. Before I do that, let me show you something. I made a little fondant dog. It's not the greatest. I'm not a very good sculpture. Um, and basically what I did was I used a gel food coloring as uh, paint and I let the fondant dry for about a good three days before I painted it. And I'm trying to make um, her dog, which is a black and white cocker spaniel. Okay, so the little footprints that I wanted to um, show you, um, the icing is, the, the cake has been in the refrigerator for about an hour, so it's good and hard the icing is. So what we can do is with the chopstick, poke a hole, wipe the chopstick off, and then pokes three small holes. To create a little footprint. Now I don't know if you can see that. Let's see if I can zoom in. Hopefully you guys can see that little footprint. And so I'm gonna do that all around the cake and get a little um, get a little like pathway walking so he so that it looks like he's gone through the course already. Okay, and so that's the dog agility cake. Um, remember that we used a vanilla chiffon joie for the cake. We have a raspberry filling that does not need to be refrigerated, and we iced it with Italian buttercream. And remember that all of our decorations are commonly found uh, candies and uh, chocolates and cookies. Um, and so remember that when you're decorating a cake, you don't always have to use the most expensive fondant decorations. Now granted, your fondant decorations will look a lot more professional, look a lot more real. But for a more whimsical look and for a more friendly, uh, fun look, um, feel free to use candies or anything similar to it. Um, even candies can have a very professional look to them if you um, do it in the right way. So anyway, I hope you learned a few new tricks. At the very least, you learn, you, at, least, at the very least, you get to see how a square cake is iced, um, and uh, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you had a good time, and remember, the aubergine chef, demystifying dessert, one recipe at a time.